And uh, it's just that we do this on Sunday and we don't have textbooks. We have the Word of God. And it's such a privilege to be in Sunday school and to hear the Word of God. As Brother Hunt says, no matter who's preaching it, no matter who's teaching it, it's such an honor and a privilege. I want to thank every one of you for being here, and I hope that you enjoy the lesson. And we want to welcome uh, those by way of the web. We hope that you get something out of this lesson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, and Robert, if you will, if you'll come and take the offering up, and we'll get started on our lesson today. That's God's blessing upon the offering, please. Bless this offering we ask in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And everybody said amen. Amen. All right. While he takes up the offering, I'm just going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, I was running late this morning. I went off and forgot my glasses, and I couldn't have seen you. Well, I could have seen you. I take that back. But I couldn't have seen what I had down here if I didn't have my glasses. I had to turn around and go back. So... I hope my teaching's not like that. But uh, uh, Brother Blanton taught last week on John 8 and did a wonderful job. And uh, so I'm going to be speaking on John 9. We're going through the book. and uh, But I do want to start out. I want to read a few scriptures. And I'm going to read the last two verses of uh, chapter 8. And then I'm going to read John chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. Uh, 8 and 58 says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Chapter 9, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in them. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We see that in, in the latter part of chapter 8, we see how that Jesus uh, told the Jews, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And when he said this, the Jews knew that he was claiming to be God and that he was claiming to have come from heaven. And because of this, we see that this angered the Jews. Uh, it just infuriated the Jews, and it made them so angry that they began to cast stones at Jesus. And it says he went through the midst of them. You know, now I read a commentary where it said that he, was, he went escaping for his life. I do not believe that, and this is why I do not believe it. It was prophesied how Jesus Christ was going to die. And the prophecy of the word of God is going to come to pass. He was going to be crucified. He was not going to be stoned to death. But we see that Jesus went through the midst of them. And as he did, as we look at chapter 9, if you will look at that very first uh, verse, and you see how that Jesus, even though he had gone through all the accusations of the Jews, he had gone through uh, even them trying to stone him to death, as they did Peter. But nonetheless, Jesus, we see, he sees a man as he is leaving this situation, and he sees a man. And others may have taken no note of this man, but Jesus did. And it said, this man was blind. And you see that Jesus, even though uh, what he had gone through, this is what Jesus is. Jesus is full of compassion. He's full of love. He's full of mercy. 
and he came to manifest uh, the love of God upon this earth, and he sees this man that is blind. And, you know, this man, when you think about it, now this, this man was blind. He did not see Jesus, but Jesus saw him. And, you know, uh, this, uh, this should speak volumes to each and every one of us. The man could not see Jesus. He was blind. And many times we get in places in our lives where we feel alone. We feel that uh, no one understands us. No one knows where we are. And we just feel alone. And, but we can look at this scripture and we can know that Jesus knows just exactly where we are. And he knows just exactly what we have need of. He looked at this man and he had compassion upon him. Now in verse 2, we see that the disciples, they see the blind man, I guess it, because Jesus had taken note of him, uh, and they asked Jesus a very odd question. They said, who has sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents? Now, that was an odd question because, number one, the man was born blind. He could not have committed any sin. There's no such thing as committing sin in the womb, although we're all conceived in sin. But we see that they asked, was it this man or was it the parents that sinned? And this shows the opinion of a lot of people, I believe, in regards to sickness. You have those that believe that all sickness, if you're sick, then it was brought on because you are living in sin. And I believe the Word of God bears out that, that many people look at it in this way. Uh, number one, let's look at Job. When his friends came, that was some kind of friends, was it not? I mean, you've sinned, Job. All of this would not be taking place, and you would not be going through this if you had not sinned. You've sinned. But we see that there is a sickness that can be brought on by sin. And I'm talking about personal sin, and I'm talking about personal sickness. I believe that that can take place, and I believe that the Word of God bears it out, and I believe that life bears it out also. But all sin is not that way. But let's look at the chapter 5 of James and verse 15, and I'm not sure I even put that on there, but to show you that I feel that some sins uh, do bring on sickness. It says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins they shall be forgiven him now what does that say it's talking about someone that's sick and it's telling us what we do the prayer of faith anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will raise them up it says that if they have committed any sins, that those sins will be forgiven. So that tells me there is such a thing as sin bringing on sickness. But that's not the case with everyone that gets sick. If that's the case, none of us would be here today because none of us are perfect. We may not be out, <coughs> excuse me, we may not be out uh, doing things what... Uh, Sometimes we call sin. We're not out robbing anyone. We're not out uh, committing uh, murder or doing uh, any of the, the heinous crimes that we hear of on the news. But the Word of God says, For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. But some people stand in judgment that every sickness is brought on because you are in sin. And if you are not healed, then you just don't have faith. I do not go along with that either. 
But nonetheless, why the sickness? There are different reasons for sickness. Number one, ever since the Garden of Eden and man fell, what did God tell Adam? The day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Did they die that day? No, but their body began to die. And you know, uh, like Brother Hunt says, uh, one, I am 100% sure of this, that 100% of us that are here today, that if we do not go in the rapture, you will die. I will die. Even as I speak to you today, each and every one of us are in a dying condition. No, we may not be on a bed of affliction, but we are dying. Just as sure as we are born, we are going to die. And why? We're, it, because sin, sin is in the world. We are subject to uh, sin. We are subject to troubles. We are subject to death. Does that make one more ungodly? Or more of a sinner? Does it make one more righteous? What does it do? I want us to look at something that, uh, to me, it goes along with this lesson uh, uh, that's in Luke. And it's chapter 13 and verse uh, 1 through 4. It says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus, answering, said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? What did Jesus say? I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus goes on to say, Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Once again, Jesus says, Nay, or no, but except you repent, you will perish. In other words, what was Jesus saying? He was saying that there is no one without sin and that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I think we can all say amen to that, that we have all sinned and fell short of God's glory. Now, I'm not condoning sin when I speak of this, and, and I'm sure you all understand the way that I mean this. But there will always be sickness as long as we're upon this earth. If we do not go in the rapture, we're going to die, people. We're all going to be put six foot under, or we're going to be cremated. We're going to be lost at sea. We're going to fly apart in the air if we're in the, you know, or whatever. We will die. We will be sick. But we see that. Because of sin, there will always be sickness. But we see also here that Jesus, uh, th they want to know who sinned. Jesus, in verse uh, 3, he says, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. We see that Jesus, many times in the book of John, he says over and over and repeatedly that he came to work the works of the Father. He came to do the will of the Father. He came to do the works of God. And he says also in this scripture, he said to do it for the night is coming when no man can work. In other words, he was working the works of God while he was here. In the next verse, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He said, as long as I am 
in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, he worked the works of God while he was here. It was they. But the time came when he was no longer here. We know he was crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. Okay, but he did the will of the Father while he was here. And what does Jesus say about the people of God? He says that we are to be a light. We are a light in this world. And as children of light, what are we to do? We are to be about our Father's business. Now, light does something that nothing else can do. Light dispels darkness. Light overcomes darkness. So as children of God, as children of the light, we are to be doing the will of our Heavenly Father. In verse 6 and 7, and I'm going to try to take this verse by verse, and, and I don't know if I'll have time to cover it or not, but it says, and still give you time to ask questions or to make comments. Verse 6 and 7, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. You know, let's be realistic. If we were in a healing service, we hear about this man that has great healing of power, that everybody that he prays for is healed. Let's say we're in a tent revival, and you go up for prayer. Someone takes you up there because you are blind. And this evangelist, he goes and he, he spits in the dirt. And then he reaches down, and he gets that, where he spit, that clay and that spit, and he gets it and he makes it into a ball. And then it says he anointed the eyes. In other words, he rubbed, he rubbed that mud in that blind man's eyes. Now, wouldn't we think that was a little bit unordinary? Let's be honest, we would. But you know what? Jesus Christ is not ordinary. And Jesus Christ has his way. And Jesus Christ don't always work the same way every time. You don't predict him. You don't predict, you don't, you don't predict him. And after he did this to the blind man, he said in 7, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which the man, what does it say he did? He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, some of us would go to that service and we want to be healed and we're going to expect a certain person to pray a certain prayer, to do a certain thing, and then this is the way we're going to be healed. And, you know, it doesn't say anything about this man uh, other than he was obedient. He went to the pool of Siloam. And what happened? He came seeing. He did not say, even though he really did not know who Jesus was, can you not just speak a word over me and I can see? Can't you just gently lay your hand on me and pray for my sight and me be healed? No, he didn't ask those questions. Why? Because the man was blind. And the man wanted to see. And he was obedient to what Jesus told him to do. He rubbed that in his eyes, that mud in his eyes. It's about like when one time Jesus, he spit. And then he put his fingers in the ear of the man that could not hear. But you know, I dare say that if I'm blind... Let somebody make mud out of the spit that they spit into the dirt. Let them rub it in my eyes and let me go and wash and then I'll come out seeing. If I'm deaf and I can't hear 
And if someone wants to spit on their finger and stick it in my ears and then I hear, well, praise God, let them spit in the dirt or spit on their finger just so I can see and just so I can hear. Praise God. But we see that he did this. And, I mean, this was an unorthodox thing that he did, that, that Jesus did. But we see that the man was obedient and he came back seeing. Obedience is better than sacrifice, the Word of God says. But uh, I read something very unique about the pool of Siloam. It said that the pool of Siloam got its waters... It, they were supplied from Mount Zion and that they were living waters which were healing waters. As I studied this, I thought about another healing in the Old Testament and that was Naaman. Naaman was a powerful man, a powerful man, a man of valor, the Bible says, but he was a leper. But there was a little maid that told his, his uh, wife, if there is a prophet, that if he'll go to that prophet, he can heal Naaman. The long and short of it is, he went, he went to the prophet Elijah's house. And when he gets there, Elisha doesn't even come out. He just sends a messenger and says, you tell Naaman to go and dip seven times in the river Jordan. Well, Naaman was a man of power. He was a man uh, of prestige. And I mean, you mean, I thought surely that the man of God would come out. But he did not. He became so mad and angry that he was going to leave. But then when his servant said, now if he had asked you to do something great, would you not have done it? And, and they persuaded him to go to the Jordan River. So what happened? He dipped seven times and he was healed. His skin became just like a newborn baby. So what is the difference between the blind man and Naaman? The blind man was a humble man, I believe that. Naaman, because of his power, he was a prideful man, and it, he had to be humbled to receive his healing. But praise God, God humble us if that's what it takes. Humble us if that's what it takes. But we see that in verse 8, the neighbors therefore and they which, they which before had seen him that he was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, he's like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus. Think of that. A man that is called Jesus. He made clay and he anointed my eyes and told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went, and I washed, and I received my sight. Man, when I read that, it was like that just come at me. A man that is called Jesus. Praise God. I'm so thankful for the day when I met that man that is called Jesus. And just as this man's eyes were opened naturally, and for the first time, he could see the light of day. Just as his eyes were open naturally, when we came to this man that is called Jesus, our eyes were open for the first time spiritually. He was in darkness. He was blind. But you and I, we were in darkness. We were in the darkness of our sin because we were sinners and we were living in the dark. But when we came to this man named Jesus, for the first time we too saw light. 
we saw the light of Jesus Christ and the power and the love and what he could do for us in our lives. And we saw the light, like the song says, praise the Lord, I saw the light. I thank God that I saw the light when Jesus Christ, I met this man called Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Verse 12, it says, Then said they unto him, Where is he? Where is this man called Jesus? He said, I know not. They brought to the, they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He said to them, he put clay up on my eyes and washed, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division. There's a lot right there in that one verse. The Pharisees were so blind by their vain traditions that they had added to the commandments of God, to the, to the word that God had given to Moses. Man had added all of these, I heard like 500, I'm not sure, all of these things that they were to do and not to do and, and all of that. But it says that this man... He can't be of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Well, which was most important? And remember this. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So which was the most important? The man that had been blind from the day he was born until then, and that Jesus Christ healed him? or that he did it on the Sabbath. Well, you shouldn't do that. You should do that. And the Sabbath was a Saturday. You should have done that Sunday through Monday. You could have waited until tomorrow to heal that man, or you could do it a week later. No, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and he healed the man that day. But others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles because we know that God does not hear the prayer of a sinner. He hears that prayer of repentance from a sinner, but God does not answer a sinner's prayer. And this is something that's very important in this verse right here. It says, and there was a division among them. You think about that. There was a division among them. Here were the Pharisees. They were the religious ones. But they were so blind, spiritually blind. Yes, they were. But then you had the others who said, well, how can a man, if he's a sinner, how can he do such things? So there was a division among them. And I want to bring something to our attention. Jesus Christ always brings division. You say, well, now, hey, that doesn't sound right. Jesus Christ will always bring division. Luke 12 and 51, Jesus said, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. How is Jesus Christ going to bring division upon this earth? The Bible says when he came, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Yes, that's what Jesus Christ wants out of every one of us. And it'll be peace on earth and goodwill to men the day when he sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. Only then will there be total peace. Yes, Jesus Christ is peace. But let me tell you where there is division. There is division between light and dark. Jesus Christ is light. 
Satan and the world is dark. There is a division between righteousness and unrighteousness. There is a division between evil and a division between evil and good. There is a division that will always be there. The Bible says, what has Christ got to do with Belial? What has Christ got to do with him? God is holy. Sin is unholy. Jesus Christ, there will be a division on this earth as long as we're here. Just as I said, it comes in families. Let's look at it like this. A man and a woman marries, and they're both sinners. I can say this from myself. You're both sinners. Well, then I came to God. My husband did not come to God. There was a division. Did we divorce? No. But was there a division? Yes. Why? Because I was of the light and he was still in darkness. And until he got in the light, there was a division. It separates. Jesus Christ separates. Now, if y'all have anything to say any different, you'll have your opportunity. But I'm going by what Jesus said right here. There will always be a division. Light has nothing to do with darkness. Jesus Christ is light. Jesus Christ is love. Jesus Christ, he wants to make whole. It's when we as humanity refuse to allow Jesus Christ to be Lord in our life. That's when the division comes. In verse 17, it said, They say unto the blind man, What sayest thou of him that he has opened thine eyes? He said, He's a prophet. Now, he did not know who Jesus was. This blind man, I wonder if this man was a Jew. It does not say, so I will not say. But he said, They said, What do you say about him? You know, this man had opened your eyes. He said, He's a prophet. You know, uh, they had, uh, they did not have any understanding, these religious Jews. It's sad, you know, there's, and there is, let me say this. There is a vast difference between religion and Christianity. Anything can be a religion. You have, excuse me, you have Muslim religion. That has nothing to do with Christ. Don't be deceived by the billboards that says that their Jesus is the same Jesus of the New Testament. That is a lie. That is a lie. And I can prove it. No. They don't even believe that Allah, which is a false god, had a son. He can't have a son. So there cannot be a son of God, Jesus Christ. And I won't go into all of that. But nonetheless, you, religion is different from Christianity. Christianity is relationship. Christianity is the one where he came and paid a price that you and I could be free from our sins and love and serve him and have a hope of eternity in heaven with him because all of us were sinners. In verse 18... But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But I want, us to, I want us to hear this cop-out, excuse me, this cop-out that his parents give. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. This, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already 
that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. In reality, the Jews wanted to disprove the miracle of this healing. In reality, they did not, they had to either be convinced it was truth, that he had truly been healed, or they had to be confounded by the fact that he was. And yet they were in their vain traditions and refusing to believe that this was the Messiah that had been prophesied of, that had come. But we see they could not bear, they could not bear the light of the truth. They could not bear that. And they did not want others to know it. They did not want others to discover that this is a reality. This man truly was blind, but now this man, he's truly been healed. For the first time since birth, this man can see. They wanted to disprove it, and they didn't want anyone else to believe it or to find out about it. And you know, that is still going on today. When you see the things that are taking place in, quote, religious circles. And when you read the Word of God and you see that Paul called them enemies of Christ. There are literally enemies of the cross. There are enemies of Christ. There are those that preach Christ out of contention. There are those that will preach and teach false doctrine because they want you to follow them and not follow the true Christ. Because in the true Christ there is life. And in the true Christ, there is salvation. In the true Christ, there is what Jesus Christ, he truly is. There is but one way. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you can believe it. There is no other way. No man will ever enter into heaven. No man, except he go through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. The only way. But there are those that hinder. They do not want people to know. We look at the parents of this man. And they, they, uh, they were fearful of the Jews. And they did not want to be cast out of the synagogue. They wanted, in, they wanted to stay in the synagogue. So what did they do? If they had told the truth. Yes, this is my son. And yes, he was born blind. And yes, this man Jesus put clay on his eyes. And yes, my son came seeing. But no, they could not say that because of fear of being cast out of the synagogue. So what does that tell me? That tells me that they chose rather to please man than to please God. They chose rather to, to not speak up for the truth and let the truth slide. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. We've got to stand for the truth no matter what comes forth because only truth is going to save us. Only truth is going to save us. Verse 24. And I'm rushing. I got 10 minutes and then you can ask or make all your comments. Then again, this poor blind man, they're wearing him out. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. He said, I just know one thing. At one time I was blind, but now I do see. Then they said to him again, in verse 26, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. 
Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? You know, they kept, it's almost like they were badgering this man. They kept coming to him. You know, uh, how did he do it? What did he do? Who was this man? Uh, and, and they kept on. And, and you know, the, I, I believe the man eventually became weary of their coming to him and doing this because they went on and on and on. I believe he was frustrated. And uh, because how many times had he been asked this same question over and over? They did not want to believe the truth. So he says to them, he said, well, do you want to be his disciple? Do, do, you, do, you want, do you want to be his follower? I mean, you keep asking me this question, and, and I keep telling you who he is, and I keep telling you what he has done. Do you want to be his disciple? This infuriated the Jews. This infuriated them. He said, you're his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, I don't like the idea that they called him fellow either. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. As I read that, I had a thought come to me, and I thought, I wonder if Moses had been there that day what would he have said to those Jews? I think he'd say like Jesus, oh, slow of heart, you know, blind of heart. Don't you see this is what I spoke of? The man answered and he said, you know, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he's from, and yet he's opened up my eyes. They reviled him and said, Thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but now, look, we don't know about this man. We don't even know where he's from, you know. I don't believe that that was the truth. And they said, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will... No, let me back up to 30. This is the man that was healed. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he's opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was blind. If this man was not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin. There's their self-righteousness another time. There's their hypocritical attitude, you know. You were born in sin. What do you know about it? And thou dost teach us? Why, look at us. We're the Pharisees, and we know the law, and we are the religious leaders, and you would speak to us. Who do you think you are? And do you teach us? And it says, and they cast him out. And I thought of something that Jesus said in another scripture when he was talking to them. I mean, here were the Jews that had the law. They had the commandments. They had the prophecies of the coming Messiah and all of that. Yet they missed the time of their visitation. They missed it. God help us not to be caught up in something, whether it's religion or whether it's the cares of life or whatever, that we miss the time of our visitation. Let's say the trump of God should sound, 
and we're so caught up with other things that we don't even hear the trump of God. But we see that I thought of Jesus when he was talking to him. He said, you know, he said, you're of your father, the devil. And he said, on the outside, you, you're like a whited sepulcher. Everything looks really good. He said, but inside, you're full of dead men's bones. In other words, you're not what you're professing to be. You are not. They were void of understanding, and they were void of God. They were void of God. But they told the blind man, we're the ones in the know. And you were born, and you're going to tell us when you were born in sin. And as I read that, I thought, did they think that they weren't born in sin? Were they so self-righteous that they thought that they had not been born in sin or ever committed sin? I'm going to finish reading this chapter, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. 34. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost teach us. And they cast him out. They cast the man out of the synagogue. But listen to this. This is our Lord. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This man did not know who Jesus was. That's why I say, I wonder if he was a Jew. Or just one of the underclass, or lower class as they called him, Jew. I don't know. But he did not know who Jesus was. But yet he trusted him. And he believed him. And then he said, Jesus said, you know, th this is, who is he, Lord? Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And I think about when they asked me if I wanted the Holy Ghost. I said, I don't know what the Holy Ghost is. And they said, do you want everything that God has for you? And I said, yes, I do. And I think this man was in that place also. When Jesus said, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am coming to this world, that they which see not might see. And that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. In Matthew 13, Jesus said, Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And there is nothing so blind as those who are blind and do not know it. I thank God. I thank God. And it is God. And I don't say it prideful. I thank God that I know who Jesus Christ is. And I thank God for what he's done in my life and in yours. Uh, I think I should have quit 10 minutes ago, was I? I think I got confused. Yeah. Anybody got a word to say? I'm sorry. I, I, I am. I truly am. I don't know why I thought I was supposed to stop at 10. You got a word? First of all, I want to thank you for teaching that lesson. I enjoyed it. And uh, Jesus always made a point 
of getting something across in his teaching. And I think it was ordained of God that this happened. <clears throat> he specifically went to that man, and he knew where that man would land up among the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I think, in my mind, God wanted to make a point to them. They knew the scripture. They can quote the scripture. They can uh, they meditate on the scripture, and they could uh, recite that scripture by heart. The first five books of the Bible, um, the, the book of Moses. The scripture says in Genesis two seven concerning that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and when he formed whatever he formed out of that clay and with his spittle and formed that and put that man uh, anointed his eyes that man had was born defective his eyes were had a defect in him they were missing something I don't know if it was missing a retina or, or whatever but he made that whatever what was needed there now he could have spoke the word he, in other places, he just would speak the word, or he would just say, let your faith heal you. But specifically this time, he forms out of the clay something the man needed so the man could see. And then the man goes back and reports what happened. They know the scripture. Jesus wanted to give them a window of opportunity to recognize who he was, but they rejected him. Uh, they absolutely rejected him. And so I think that was the point that Jesus was trying to make at this particular time. And then he came back to the man. And that's our Jesus. I mean, he's just a beautiful God, a loving God, merciful God. And I do apologize. I'm serious. I was, I'm, I was confused. <coughs> I should have quit at 20 till. But... Lord bless you, and uh, we're going to uh, now have a small break, and then we'll begin our service at 11 o'clock. Lord bless you.